your life. Hey everybody, Instagram Live has been an amazing thing to watch over the last couple of months as it, as it went from something that was used uh, occasionally by a lot of people and now is uh, one of the dominant forms of communication uh, in media these days. Uh, it's immediate, uh, it's resolute, uh, and I, I'm hoping that one of the bug fixes is going to be that when you actually hit the button, it starts. So sorry for the awkwardness at the beginning. Um, this is AZ Cooks. We are coming to you live uh, from Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, a city that has been in the news for the last couple of days in ways that, uh, sadly, uh, in ways that we, we, places in ways that we've been before. Um, I'm reminded of the situation four years ago of Philando Castile, uh, a school worker uh, who was uh, shot by police, a beloved uh, man in the city of St. Paul and to his community. Um, right now, I can tell you that uh, I know the nation is reeling from what we've seen uh, from the uh, killing of uh, Mr. George Floyd. We know that our community here is reeling uh, it is, it, it's both scary, unsettling, repugnant. It is also uh, anxiety inducing to be living in a place where just a few miles to my right, um, we know that there is going to be uh, more violence in the streets uh, this evening. When the, when the the violence erupted in Ferguson uh, for many days. Um, there was a, uh, a, I saw t-shirts and buttons and uh, memes online uh, that we see all the time in these situations where it says, we, we are blank. The shootings go on in Paris and we, we say, we are Paris. Um, we have bombs go off in another city we are other city. I remember those stickers and, and, and memes saying, you know, we are Ferguson. The point being is that what happens in one place in the country is, is something that is happening to all of us. It's reflective of our society, right? So that's in a, in a figurative sense, but in a literal sense, it's also being played out everywhere. Um, these types of things have been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's just that today, we happen to have more cell phones and more closed circuit cameras, thank God. Hopefully that hastens some change because seeing that violent, despicable, and disgusting act, that murder of you know one of our brothers in this city, Mr. Floyd, um, has galvanized a huge portion of uh, this town and hopefully we see some real permanent change come out of it. And that permanent change has to come from people that look like me. So many folks have written online, and, and I'm certainly not the expert uh, on this issue, but this idea that we have systemic problems that have gone on foundationally in this country for hundreds of years, back to the very founding of our nation, are responsible for the situation that we are in today. That is true. I would also like to remind you of some words from Dr. Martin Luther King that a friend of mine sent me today that's so apropos. It's one sentence. In the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So it is up to all of us, especially those of us, us with a platform, to come out con to condemn these acts, but also to offer up solutions. What kind of solutions are those, you might ask? Well. There's been something going around for a long time uh, that's finally getting a lot of traction, and that is let's start not just acknowledging the foundational and systemic issues of racism here in America uh, that, yes, have been amplified by the current administration, but let's start talking about anti-racism. Let's start talking about how we might actually be working towards solutions with this. And I found a fantastic uh, uh, place online called Crossroads Anti-Racism. Um, you can, uh, I'm gonna find the, uh, the uh, website for you uh, in just one second. Uh, but 
I'm, I'm personally pursuing more anti-racism education and training for myself, because you wanna know something? Assuming that I know everything about that isn't right either. We need to find out more of what's out there. Um, I also wanna read you two notes that I got, one from a friend and one from an anonymous fan. An anonymous fan wrote me today, I know Minneapolis has a place in your heart. Yes, it does. I hope justice is brought for George Floyd and tyranny and evil is swiftly brought to an end. We're all praying for that. Praying for George's family, Minneapolis, and everyone's safety. Hope you all are well and safe. It's getting notes like that from people from far-flung places in this country that lets me know that we are all Minneapolis right now. And then I want to read you something uh, from my friend uh, Adrian Fontes in Phoenix, Arizona. Really instructive. For me it said i feel for your town i feel for people who can no longer trust our systems i feel for all of us because it is the systems that that people who look like me created that are responsible for this i genuinely hope you and yours are safe and healthy and then he wrote this he said keep cooking remind us why goodness and kindness manifest in the kitchen and so that's why um and Vicki, if you'd look up on your phone, Crossroads Anti-Racism, so I can give people the, uh, um, the website info, I'd appreciate it. Um, but it was, it was my friend Adrian's reminder to me that one of the other ways that we can bring ourselves together, because I've argued that for 20 years is over food. Um, I've said, you know, I once tried to pitch a show called Dinner with a Dictator because I had found myself on Bizarre Food so many times on the road, sitting down to a meal with people on the far opposite side of things. Um, I actually was in, in Jericho in Palestine meeting with uh, a man who was an avowed terrorist who, um, who told me that he wanted to bathe in the blood of our children. I mean, just this crazy stuff. And, and I realized that, even, by the way, this is while I'm, I'm choking on the apricot juice that I'm sipping in his house. And I realized that, that my standing there uh, was my own version of Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, right? I wasn't gonna match his violence with violence. I wasn't gonna try to get into argument with him and just listen to his rhetorical screed uh, thrown back at me. Um, but what I could do is that, that I could I could do my protest the way I wanted to by standing there and telling him that I flat out thought he was uh, thought he was wrong. So what we're doing today to heal everyone is to cook a little something and to say our prayers uh, for our country in the hopes that we can heal from this tragic example of what has become all too prevalent uh, in America today. Um, a black man was murdered on the street in, in full view of everyone by a white police officer. And uh, that simply has to stop. Uh, do we have the name for uh, the Crossroads Anti-Racism site? Crossroadsantiracism.org. Crossroadsantiracism.org. Look them up, think about this, explore the idea of what anti-racism means. I've been doing that for the last couple hours. I want you to make it personal for yourself. It was very helpful to me. I hope it's very helpful to you. Um, one of the dishes that, well, the dish that we're making today is uh, a low country soused uh, shrimp dish that is, gosh, uh, probably something that I make at least once a week uh, when the weather starts to turn warm because it's served either lukewarm or cool. I never refrigerate it. Yes, the leftovers are good, but once you cook shrimp and you chill it in anything that has acid in it, like the, the lemon juice and the vinegar that's in the dressing, uh, the, the pickling, the sousing part of this comes from the acidity in the lemon juice and the vinegar. The minute that that happens, it starts to get a little tough, right? Um, there is, this dish is so good when it's served warm, or I'll make it and I'll put it on the table a half hour before people eat it and just enjoy it at room temperature. And it's really, really quite simple. I'm gonna make it with you and then we're gonna have a lot of time uh, to talk about whatever, whatever it is that you wanna talk about. Um, I have some beautiful, uh, I don't know, medium-sized shrimp. 
Uh, these are a 1620 count. Uh, in this particular case, I'm taking the entire shell off of them. And I do that really simply. Uh, I pop off this piece of the shell, leaving as much of the tail intact, and then I peel the shell off, starting with the legs. This one's broken. You can just peel the shrimp, starting with the little legs, start from the inside out, and then you can just pop that little collar right off. So now I have three shrimp, and I save all my shells in a bag in the freezer so I can make shrimp stock. You take a very, very, very small knife, and you just want to remove the vein because I buy what are referred to as wild caught shrimp. So these are shrimp that actually were in the ocean and they were eating real food and there's a vein and that vein actually has food in it. That's what that black stuff is. So all we want to do is give a gentle tug on that and clean each of the shrimp. Ooh, this one's got a big love it when that happens because I like a nice big example. Look at this. We're just going to remove that vein and the, the problem is that sometimes with wild caught shrimp that vein, that intestine actually, has sand in it or it has food in it that can turn the dish bitter and we don't want either one. Now I usually do this over a sink. But we're doing this about this Instagram Live. So I'm going to take those three shrimp that I cleaned, right? And I'm just going to rinse them in cold water. So that I know I have, if I rinse them in cold water, I know I've gotten rid of all of that problematic stuff. Um, this is a form of corbouillon. It is uh, water with a quartered lemon squeezed in it and several uh, bay leaves. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add all of our shrimp to it and I'm gonna turn this down. Now, why am I turning that down? Well, the slower that you cook a shrimp, the more tender it's going to be. So I've got super hot water, and these shrimp, while they're steeping in this water as it comes back to a simmer, are already starting to curl and cook. I want to put this dirty bowl into my sink. All right. So what's happening here in this 208 degree water right now is that it's slowly but surely going to come back to a bare simmer. And once these shrimp are cooked, we're going to add our corn. So I hope you all know how to shuck an ear of corn. Two firm strokes, get rid of the uh, those hairs that are on them. Take your knife, take a bowl, Put it upside down in another bowl. Place your corn on the top of that bowl and use the tip of your knife and slice surely from the front of the knife down to the end of the knife and take all of that corn right off the cob. Now, I was going to say, by the way, I also save my corn cobs. And the reason I save my corn cobs is I can make corn stock with them and you know, corn and lobster soup, corn and oyster soup, corn soup is so big these days. But my, my cute little parlor trick with the bowl uh, makes it so that all the corn stays in here and not on your cutting board. And of course you can see here, I chose a bowl that was just a little small. So that tip of that one pillar of corn went out into it. Oh well, not the biggest deal in the world. But now we have all our corn easily sliced. We are also going to put some halved serrano chilies in there. I use the seeds 
whenever I cook with serrano because they have a very citrusy um, quality to them. I have fresh marjoram that's going in there. I have crushed peppercorns. And I'm using my mortar and pestle because I actually want, you know, a, a true crushed peppercorn, not a ground peppercorn. And I want a lot of that pepper. This, this is all about pepper and lemon, but not that bogus pepper lemon seasoning that's loaded with chemicals. We're using green, white, pink, and black peppercorns and crushing that fairly coarsely. All of this is going to go into our shrimp dish before we drain it so that it seasons it all. Last thing that's going in there, some scallions. Light. Hmm. I wonder which light that was. One over there. Oh, we'll fix it. Um, I'm putting in these sliced scallions, which are a predominant, I mean, look at how many I'm putting in there. I mean, I'm going to put in, you know, maybe two cups of scallions because with that lemon that's going to be the predominant acid there and the white vinegar, and the fact that we're cooking these scallions for, I don't know, seconds, coming up very soon, means that they're not going to have that astringency that raw scallions have. What is marjoram? Uh, marjoram is an herb. It's very similar to oregano, except it has a little more sweetness and not as much oomph. I want to show you something. This is just coming back to a simmer right now. They've been cooking for about seven minutes. And if I drag my knife through it, the shrimp are completely cooked. And they're super, super tender. So in goes our corn, our scallions. We're going to give this one stir. That's all the cooking that we want to do on it. And then, and I know I'm using extra large equipment, you can use the colander you have at home. Then this entire thing. goes into the strainer. And this is the super duper fun part. Because this is what makes this dish so delicious. This water, this broth, goes away. Get a new bowl. Discard your bay leaves. Take out your four lemon quarters. They're in there somewhere. I always squeeze out the juice a little bit because I get some pulp from it. Where's that other one? I learned a long time ago not just to reach in because it's very, very hot, but I'll find it. And slide all of this here. Slide all of this deliciousness. into the bowl. That blanched corn, those, oh, there it is. Those blanched scallions. See when I squeeze this, out comes some of that lemon pulp. It's delicious. And so now you have this, the whole thing smells of the uh, margarine. The cooked scallions, the corn, right? those chilies, right? And they're going to keep cooking with the thermal momentum that's in there. The shrimp are perfectly tender. We've done a fantastic job with that. We're gonna save these scallions for another use. Now it's time to make what 
souses this dish, which is our vinaigrette. Sugar, vinegar, white vinegar or apple cider vinegar, lemon juice. I'm gonna put this dill right on top here so none sticks to my whisk, but the dill, olive oil, We want to whisk this together. I'm going to add a little bit of salt. Not a lot. And the reason I don't need to add a lot of salt is that the shrimp are very saline. But we're going to need to season our vinaigrette. And we're going to still need to season our salad. And just whisk this for about a minute until that sugar dissolves in the lemon juice and the vinegar. Can you define sousing? Sousing is a form of pickling. It's a term from the 16th century. Anything that's soused, we would call pickled today. So soused pig's feet or pig's feet that are cooked and then sauced with uh, vinegar or some other acid so that in a sense, the cooked pig's feet pickle. So, Souse is a whole family of foods that are pickled. And this is a very modern take on one because we're doing very light pickling in the half hour that this lemony, herby dish marinates in that lemon. Now here's the, here's the cool part. The fun part here, and if you have access to Meyer lemons, please do. We had none in the market today. The other day there were bags and bags and bags of them. I prefer to make this dish with Meyer lemons uh, because you can eat more of the lemon. These big lemons that were available in the market today uh, have a fairly bitter pith, um, but sliced thin, they're fantastic in the salad itself. So I'm just gonna slice these as thin as I can with my conventional knife here, which is pretty thin. I'm not using an electric slicer or an electric knife or a, a mandolin. It's kind of hard on a mandolin because the lemons are so soft and squishy. That wasn't a very good one, but I have like eight or 10 slices, so I think we're good to go. And the heat from this dish is actually gonna pull more of that lemon from this. We're gonna stir that in. And then the other thing that I like to do sometimes is I will actually take that last piece of lemon and with my knife, remove the pith and the skin so that I just have the fruit here. And I do something that most people don't do a lot of, which is actually finely chop your lemon. Do you have any tips about how to balance the timing when making different elements of a dish or side dishes at the same time? Well, everyone is different. That's a very vague question. But if you can give me an example of one that you're talking about, I can help you. Um, timing of food is everything. I mean, that, and, and I, the, the question is so good because folks like me get that question a lot one day of the year, Thanksgiving, right? Because that's the time that most cooks who don't cook a lot invite 20 people over and try to cook 32 dishes on four burners and have it all come out hot at the same time. So I get that question a lot at Thanksgiving. Um, you know, depending on what your menu is, I'll give you an example. The other night on my Instagram, I posted a plate of grilled beef with caramelized onions with beet greens in them, which is a great combination, by the way, and a uh, sweet potato mash with goat butter and smoked brown sugar. And that, to me, was a big timing issue. So I'll tell you what I did. 
I made completely from start to finish the mashed sweet potatoes. And I put them in a bowl with uh, aluminum foil uh, and then the lid in the pan, so it was nice and airtight, and I put it in a 200 degree oven so it would stay hot. Then I went upstairs and uh, grilled the steak. Brought the steak down on a platter, put the platter in a warm spot in my kitchen, right next to the burners, sort of towards the back, and then I caramelized my onions with the beet greens. And then I took the mash out and brought them all to the table where I plated it up so that my onions and beet greens were hot. The beet greens hadn't wilted. That was the most sensitive part of the dish. The steak could rest for 10 minutes or 30 minutes. Doesn't matter, right? Room temperature steak is delicious. The important part is to rest it. The mash could hold indefinitely in the 200 degree oven. What was sensitive to me were the beet greens that I wanted to be crunchy and fresh in the caramelized onions that went on top of the steak. So you always time your meal around the most sensitive item on the menu, which in that case was those beet greens. Now look at this. This is just so, so gorgeous. Now I will tell you the juices from the corn and the shrimp come out in there, the chilies, that are here that are split, blanched in that hot water. So we have a little bit of cooked chili flavor, but they are having their heat pulled out of them by the acidity in that vinaigrette. Everything is being changed by the acidity in the vinaigrette. And so I sort of make sure that my chilies, my marjoram is all pushed down in there. And then you let this sit for 20 minutes before you serve it. Now it's already rested for about 10. So I have about another 10 minutes before I serve it. Do I have enough dill in there? Yeah, I do. I always have a little extra. So, you know, wrap up your extra scallions, wrap up your extra dill uh, and put those away. And we'll try this together in about 10 minutes. We have to figure out some kind of way to fly when this C-19 uh, business uh, has gone on to the next phase. Uh, we need to figure out a way to fly someone in here. Uh, you have to wear your mask and come and uh, eat one. You can lift your mask while you're tasting the food. But we'll fly someone here uh, to do this. We're also gonna have, I think in June, we're gonna try to have some guest chefs on. And don't let me forget to talk about what's going to happen uh, next, the next two Thursdays that we're doing this uh, before we leave. Is there another question from our how, lovely audience? How long will the meal you're making now last in the fridge for leftovers? Oh, if uh, Vicki and Madeline and I will probably house this entire bowl. Uh, but if there were leftovers, it can stay in there for at least 24, 48 hours. The problem is with this dish, rarely are there leftovers. That's number one. Number two, the minute you refrigerate this dish, it starts to go from an A to an A minus to a B plus because all of these, everything about this dish is about the, the brightness of it. And the more those ingredients all sit together, instead of 10 flavors all coming together on your fork, it ends up being one sort of shrimpy, lemony flavor. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like a vinaigrette. When you make one, it tastes really good. And then like a half hour later, it's at its peak because that little bit of garlic or that little bit of musk, the flavors have bloomed together and you taste everything in balance. And that's when you should eat it and eat it right then. If I have leftover vinaigrette, I usually use it to like marinate chicken and I'll let it marinate for like two days. I'm a 48 hour marinator with chicken. None of this 24 stuff, 48. Um, and with this dish, if I put half of this away right now and came back on Saturday, 48 hours from now, would I eat it? Yes. Would it taste good? Yes. Would it be as good as it is now? No. Are you gonna do anything with the cooking liquid? Or uh, well, you... uh, the broth that's back there, no. You know, this is a, well, I don't wanna grab it. Here's the deal. Um, the shells of the shrimp actually have more flavonoids and, and essential oils uh, in them uh, than, and the heads than the actual flesh of the shrimp itself does. Much in the same way that the meat of chicken has less of those elements than the bones do, which is why we make stocks and broths typically from bones, right? The flesh contributes something, but it's in, in the case of the shrimp, it's the head 
and the tails and the shell that has all of that flavor. So I make my stocks by caramelizing with tomato paste and mirepoix, uh, my shrimp shells, adding some, uh, some brandy or, uh, or white liquor, uh, letting it pull some more of that flavor out, adding some water, and then uh, simmering it for an hour at 90 minutes tops and then straining it. Um, if you cook your uh, shrimp shell or lobster shell or crab shell stocks too long, they end up being, uh, uh, they get too strong a minerally taste uh, to them and they start to turn bitter. And you don't want that. You wanna be very, very gentle with your stock because when you reduce that down, it will amplify the good and bad flavors. So you wanna make sure that you have a really sweet, aromatic, crustacean -y stock, not one that's too bitter from the taste of shell. Too much of that iodine shell flavor is bad. That liquid over there, while it's turned white, doesn't have a lot of shrimp flavor uh, in it. It has a lot of lemon and uh, pepper flavor, and it really isn't good for a lot. Um, if you knew, if I knew that tomorrow's menu was a boiled lobster, or I was doing a crab boil with sausage and corn, the rest of that, for tomorrow's meal, maybe I'd let that cool and stick it in the fridge just because it's got better flavor than just water, but you know, essentially it's not worth anything. A couple of substitution questions. Could yes. you use lime instead of lemon? Absolutely, you can use lime instead of lemon. What about something instead of corn? Uh, absolutely, you wanna use peas, you wanna use celery, you wanna use uh, diced fennel, whatever you have. Uh, to me right now, as we head into this time of year, I start thinking, I put everything through what I call my CTF, corn tomato filter. <laughs> How am I gonna work corn and tomatoes into every meal between now and September? Uh, and I'll tell you why. This happened to me the other day. I made a uh, tomato mozzarella salad with fresh basil and olive oil. The last time I made one of those at my house was the second week in September last year with the last tomatoes of the farmer's market season. And I purposely don't eat that salad because I literally can eat that almost every single day also. And invariably goes to someone's house, they've got the tomato mozzarella thing going on. But by the end of the summer, I'm so tired of it. But at the end of spring, I'm dying for stuff like this. If I don't eat a soft shell crab soon, I'm gonna commit separate Yes. Must-haves for a well-stocked spice cabinet. Oh my God, must-haves for a well-stocked spice cabinet? Easiest to answer in the whole world. Um, there are incredible online stores. Uh, I'm very biased here in the Midwest. We have a, a Midwest startup that's now a global brand called Penzies. Uh, P-E-N-Z-E-Y apostrophe S. I think it's penziespices.com or penziespice.com, but if you just Google Penzies, you'll find it. Penzies actually sells these like starter kits that make for great uh, house. If someone has a new home, uh, it's a great thing to bring to them because mostly they're bringing their five-year-old spices that are no good from their old house to their new house. Um, but they have starter kits. Here's the six things that you have to have. Here's the 20 things that you have to have. I, I tend not to get very specific because what's the point of having uh, uh, clove and allspice and ground cinnamon and that kind of stuff if you do no baking at all. I mean, yes, you may use some cinnamon in some uh, Indian or Chinese dishes or something like that, but you're really, unless you're baking, you're not going to need that whole side of things. Um, sometimes I tell people, well, you got to have dried oregano, you got to have dried basil, you got to have, you know, dried tarragon and all the rest of that. There, there's very few applications that I use dried basil and dried tarragon for, although I have applications I use all the time for dried mint and dried oregano because in dried form they have very specific usages. Um, so it really depends what you like. I'm more of a person who is into the seed spice must-haves. So I have to have cumin and coriander, whole and brand, right? Uh, all the I must have 17 types of paprika. Uh, hot, sweet, varietal by pepper, Mexican variations, Hungarian uh, and Eastern European variations, because I love to cook with uh, paprika and all kinds of different things. So it really depends on what you like to cook. And then I have a whole separate, like I love to cook Chinese food. I cook it at least, I don't know, three times a week. 
Um, so I have a whole shelf in my pantry, not just like cupboard, but a shelf with all of my Chinese things that I can literally just go and take out my box and bring it in because it's a whole other set of ingredients that have nothing to do with the ones that are more European in nature. It's the same thing when I'm cooking Indian food. I have a whole shelf, you know, the Indian uh, attention to spice uh, and flavor combinations is unmatched in any other cuisine in the world. Uh, and it, it requires, to, where else do I use fenugreek or curry leaves or any of those things or ajwan seeds? It's when I'm cooking food from uh, Desi countries. If, if you were a drink, what would you be? Uh, my favorite one from when I was drinking, uh, cocktail wise, and that's a Negroni. Really big, fat, beautiful Negroni. Uh, but I haven't had a drink in 28 years and four or five months. Um, this has been 20 minutes uh, now. Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, there was one thing that I didn't do that I always do uh, with food, and that is taste it and season it at every step of the way. And if you've watched me cook, we, we get notes all the time. Why are you facing with your fingers? And why are this pile of tasting spoons? And I keep jars with spoons in them uh, here on the, uh, on the cooking island. Um, I don't with this one because I legitimately make this so much, I could do it with my eyes closed. And I know it's perfectly seasoned. And the recipe is one of those recipes that is super tight. I mean, you follow the amounts on that recipe uh, page at andrewzimmern.com and uh, it's gonna be a home run for you every single time. Will you do a class on cooking walleye sometime? Mm. Yes. One of the things we're gonna do in July, maybe end of June, is walleye two ways. We're gonna steam a whole walleye with ginger and scallion and treat it the way the Chinese would. And then we're gonna do one that's more of a shore lunch where we fry it with homemade coleslaw. This is ridiculous. Wow. When do you know, how do you know when to throw out dried spices? Uh, when I bring dried spices into my house, I do the same thing that I do with baking soda and baking powder. I take my magic marker and I put the date on it, including the year, including the year. Put it right on the top. You've got a big fat label that says human. Just write the date on the top or the bottom if you're like super freaked out about staring at dates. I cook a lot, so I tend not to have to throw out a lot of things. I also, if I have you know, three inches of paprika that is in a jar or a can and it's a year old, I'll make a, a little batch of chicken paprikash or something really fast and utilize it because I hate to throw stuff out, but I'm just like you. I have stuff way in the back there that I forgot about <laughs> the other day. I, I, I go through oregano, dry oregano a lot uh, because I love it to, with yogurt and lemon, I mix that and that's a very typical marinade in our house for, uh, pork shish kebab and chicken and stuff like that. It's a really great combination. Um, so I go through it like by the handful. So I had bought oregano like four or five times before I discovered two jars way in the back that were past their prime. Um, and I didn't throw them out. I dumped them both into a bowl, covered them with lemon juice and let them sit there for about 45 minutes. So that acid pulled every bit of oregano flavor out in there. Then I hit it with some yogurt and I used it to marinate what turned out to be some really, really ballin' uh, uh, pork shoulder skewers. And here's what I learned. I can always use more oregano in a marinade with yogurt and lemon juice, always. If you have a magical power, what would it be? If I could have one? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Uh, I, you know, what, what are the three big ones? Like invisibility, super strength, or flying. Right, um, I'm no stalker, I'm a really upfront person. Uh, I definitely uh, don't need to be the strongest person in the room. I definitely am selfish enough to be able to want to fly. That would, yeah, fly. What's your favorite dessert? My favorite dessert, coffee ice cream. 
Well, it, why? It, it, well, eh. I, I was just telling your friend this last night. I, I love coffee ice cream. That's my death row meal. It's why it just came right out of my mouth. At the end of the day, two scoops of incredibly dense coffee, really, really coffee-ish coffee ice cream with a little bit of hot fudge on it, that classic sort of Broadway Sunday is what, what gets me going. However, when I really think about it, I mean, I travel to certain places in the world just to eat the fresh fruit. I mean, that's how much of a fresh fruit person I am. The thing that confounds me the most about American markets is that none of the fruit is allowed to ripen and then brought into the store. It's a horrific system. It's why I love farmer's markets in the summers. It's why I, it's why I literally go so many times a year to, you know, Mexico, Jamaica, Cartagena. I, I have to make sure that multiple times a year I'm going to these places where the fruit is just extraordinary and all tree ripened. So I can go to the markets and go to the roadside stands and just always have fruit on this big table in my hotel room or the house that I'm renting loaded with fresh fruit. So fresh fruit, as cliched as it sounds, not for the health reasons of it, far, far from it, um, but I just love tree ripened fruit. It's delicious. Who makes the best coffee ice cream? Oh, well, happy birthday, Hagen dazs it, It's the 60th anniversary of coffee ice cream because I, 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 when I'm at the store, if I need, if I got a coffee ice cream fix, I buy the Hagen dazs coffee ice cream, and I noticed they had a 60 on the it's their anniversary packaging. So happy birthday! That was the first coffee ice cream I ever tasted. Then my dad got me into scoop shops when I was little. Uh, a place called Bailey's uh, in Boston that's now closed. Um, going everywhere in America for coffee ice cream, I have to tell you that there's a place in Eugene, Oregon called Prince Pucklers. They have like four or five types of coffee ice cream in their case. And I asked the manager why, and they said the owner of the place just loves coffee ice cream like I do, so they have like espresso, cafe au lait, cafe con leche, Mexican coffee, and they have all of these different coffee flavors. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary. So yeah, I'm just gonna go Prince Pucklers. How do you make salads exciting again? Salads exciting again? Texture. Um, and don't think crouton. Um, I will take, uh, I'll make homemade croutons with lots of olive oil and herbs and garlic and grated lemon zest, um, and I will mix it with cheese and I will put it back into the oven till the cheese gets crispy, like grated Parmesan or Pecorino, then let that cool and then pulse it in the food processor. And you get a thick breadcrumb that's so intensely flavorful. And use that crunchy uh, bread thing as another layer of texture on your salads. Make sure that you have crisping. Salad shouldn't just be about lettuce as beautiful as this is, salad is so much more than lettuce, right? So I, I posted a picture the other day of the salad that I make at least three or four times a week because it's my favorite, which is, you know, some people call it Greek salad, some people call it Israeli salad. I just call it uh, summer salad uh, because it's ingredients that here in Minnesota are best in the warm weather months. Uh, and there's a, you know, 2,000 square mile part of the world where this, you know, whether it's Turkey, Greece, you know, Israel, Lebanon, doesn't matter where, uh, they still make the same salad, which is tomatoes and cucumbers and onions, uh, and then usually some kind of hard cheese. And my favorite one is with feta, uh, oregano, lemon juice, a little bit of red wine vinegar and olive oil. Absolutely adore it. If you had to pick one place to vacation for the rest of your life, where would it be? One place to visit for the rest of my life, where would it be? Uh, oh my gosh, I, I mean, that's like, that's like being Grandpa Walton and having to pick your favorite grandchild. That's a really unfair question. Um, to me, it's the, it's the fact that there are so many places that makes the traveling exciting, which is why when people say, where's the, your favorite place, it's always the place that I've been last. Um, the, the place where I went last before C-19 shut everything down was East Rutherford, New Jersey. And I was in a hotel room overlooking uh, Meadowland Stadium, where the giant, it's now Gillette, Gillette, what are they, I forget who has the naming rights to it now. Um, but it's where the Giants play. And 
I was complaining to someone like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm literally in, a, in, in the, just a hotel. I can't, can't walk out the door. I can't go anywhere. It's on the highway. I can't do anything. Nothing to do in the hotel. And I was there for like three or four days. And what would I do now to be back there? Because I love traveling. Just the, just the fact that I'm somewhere else gets me excited. Um, so I think the place that I'd want to go is uh, wherever the next plane is taking me to. And I don't mean that to be like a douchey answer. I mean, it just is like, that's, that's where I am right now. Um, it, it, it sort of reminds me of, of one of my favorite new quotes. Um, I think when people talk about the glass being half full or half empty, um, they're missing the point of it all. The, the glass isn't half full or half empty, the glass is refillable. And I think one of the things that the last 90 days have taught us is to be grateful for having a glass that's refillable. And I think we need to get back to the business, not only of healing from this horrific pandemic that is engrossing us, but we have to get on with the business of remaking and re-energizing our society to a place where the hate and the violence um, that has been plaguing us for the last 400 years uh, finally gets worked on. We're all human beings, all of us, and we all deserve the same amount of uh, decency and dignity and respect uh, given to us all. And I think that's a lovely, lovely place to end it today. Uh, next week, we are going to be coming to you with an Ask Me Anything edition. I'm actually gonna be on the highway somewhere in the middle of the country on a much needed driving vacation uh, for myself. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm just headed out of the road and I'm gonna take some time uh, and just chill. So, next week, no kitchen, it's you and me, and I will, yes, I'm actually gonna answer your most brutal questions 100% honestly, that's my scouts on a promise. I think it's going to be an edition of AZ Cooks with No Food IG Live edition that you're not going to want to miss. See you next Thursday.